Thank you for joining the Levers for Change podcast, where we search for who is responsible for what in making an impact on the environment, the energy systems, and the economy. I was very much looking forward to chatting with a friend and today's guest, Jackie Drumheller. For many years, Jackie led corporate sustainability strategy for Alaska Air Group, which includes Alaskan Airlines, Horizon Air, and Virgin America. And as a frequent customer, I was excited by the opportunity to get an inside peek at how sustainability gets embedded into the customer experience. As we will see, it's a story of passion, persistence, and patience, as well as taking advantage of the opportunity when it presents itself. So let's see what might happen if your CEO happens to stand next to your desk and makes the mistake of asking you what you're working on. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us this today. Thank you. This Jenny. afternoon. You know, Jackie, you are very well known to have spent, now I can say, several decades at Alaskan Airlines. Several decades. <laughs> several yes. decades. Uh, heading your sustainability efforts over there. So, in looking up your background, I would like to ask what does it take to become a licensed zoologist? <laughs> You know, you'd be surprised. Um, yes, I'm a certified zookeeper, not a licensed zoologist. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm a certified zookeeper. Um, wow, you really dug um, deep into the archives to get that information. So I was majoring in biology at school, and somebody said, let's be zookeepers. I'm sure, what does that involve? So I was actually at the uh, L.A. County Zoo every, probably once a week, we would go up there for a lecture on zoology from the actual director of the zoo, of the L.A. County Zoo. He was a veterinarian, and he was teaching this class. And once you pass your six-week mammalian reproduction class with the zookeeper and took the testing and everything, then you went on to more of a zoology class at the zoo. Mm -hmm. And then you spent some time volunteering at the zoo on the weekend, so you had to spend a certain amount of time. And after that was all done... Then you got your official, and I can show it to you, it's in the other room, official zookeeper <laughs> certification. And probably some of the best stories I have involved my experience as volunteering at the zoo. <laughs> and so then, you know, from the start of your career in biology mm -hmm. and working as a zookeeper, 21 years at Alaskan Airlines, and now you're a lecturer at University of Washington, Tacoma. Yes. How do you synthesize these several decades of experience into the single term that you have to teach? Oh, well, you know, it wasn't just biology. I mean, I, it took me, as I tell my students, it took me seven and a half years to get my bachelor's degree <laughs> back when uh, school was only $300 a semester mm -hmm. and you were waiting tables and you couldn't decide whether you'd be an art major or a business major or a biology major and none of the units were transferable between majors, so I graduated with 350 semester credits. <laughs> um, I think I use it all. You know, certainly when I'm making a PowerPoint presentation, I can make a really fine one using my art skills. <laughs> and the business at the time I thought was horribly boring. I fell asleep at all of my business classes, so I had to switch majors after two years. And uh, and biology, there's there's still a lot of science that I use and the sustainability and certainly all these experiences, um, sharing them with my students and telling them that it's never too late. You can start off in any direction you want. You might find a fascinating path that you can follow on the way and go someplace you didn't imagine and still have a great time. So, you know, looking at Alaskan Airlines, you started there in in, uh, in the environmental team and then worked your way into the sustainability team. And from what I understand, a lot of the uh, sustainability efforts started as a grassroots efforts in various green teams and whatnot. Yes. So how did you get executive buy-in and support uh, in order to grow that effort? You know, it takes a long time. And I think that's it's really important. I think that's one of the most fundamentally important things in a large organization is you have a good executive sponsor and there's somebody who believes in what you're doing and is willing to go to bat for you. You know, originally I was in environmental affairs working on environmental policy and regulatory issues and we were in the safety division at the time and um, I was probably, you know, I've had enough. I've done everything I could do in that in that role. So I was getting a little, I don't know, Peevish, I suppose. And uh, it just so happens the CEO, the former CEO, Bill Ayer, was walking through my office at the time. And he was to have a meeting with the vice president of safety. And the vice president of safety had to use the men's room. And so the CEO was left unattended for a moment. 
And he made the mistake of asking me what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I leapt up and I didn't quite knock him to the floor and stand on his chest and stick my finger in his face. But it was somewhere along the lines of, you know, we need to do a better job here going beyond compliance. We need to do more environmental stuff. I can't believe we have polar bears on our marking materials, but we can't even recycle our cans on our planes. And blah, 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 that kind of thing. And originally he had a, kind of a look of fear in his eyes. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, why did I talk to this crazy lady? And then they started to twinkle after a few minutes. And then, you know, I had my say and the vice president came and rescued him and they went off to their meeting and I got an email later in my inbox from the vice president who said, um, Jackie, uh, Bill Ayer and I were talking about you <laughs> at our meeting today, and he said he was interested in your proposal. <laughs> and I went, oh, <laughs> what am I going to do now? And so at the very same time, concurrently, uh, somebody in the marketing department was trying to form a green team. And I had not been to any of the meetings, but I had heard about it, and I think they had maybe one meeting or something like that. And the next meeting was like the next day. I'm like, uh-oh. So I ran over there and talked to everybody at the meeting. I said, let me tell you about what happened with me in Miller yesterday. He wants a proposal. <laughs> well, he thinks I have a proposal. <laughs> he I have a proposal. So we put our heads together. We crafted sort of seven kind of low-hanging fruit projects that we thought we could do right away that would get more buy-in and demonstrate that it could be done and maybe we could save some money too. And uh, we accomplished six out of the seven. Wow. You know, got some good buzz generated, and eventually, eventually, we attracted an executive sponsor. It was the executive vice president of the legal department, hmm. and he was a former. He wanted to be an environmental attorney when he was younger, and so he had that passion for the topic. His name was Keith Loveless, and uh, he started showing up for our green team meetings after a few months. You know, we started writing articles for the company paper and things like that, trying to create some sort of buzz and excitement about it. And, you know, and it was good timing, too. This was like 2008, 2009. Al Gore just had an in inconvenient truth. The topic was on the cover of every single magazine, every single paper. People were really excited about it. People were worried. And there was a lot of passion in, 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 with employees in the company. And we just managed to harness that and kind of keep the ball rolling. Eventually, I got myself a part-time position as with the title sustainability. So I was doing like 10% sustainability, 90% environmental compliance, and then, you know, 20, 80 and 50, 50 and that kind of stuff until finally it became a hundred percent sustainability all the time. And, but that took years, you know, to build up that steam. And, um, we started creating our governance structure and our goals and our long-term vision and things like that. And it eventually built out. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like a lot of this was timing, luck, but also was preparedness, given that there were already a green team, already this people like the attorney that was interested in these issues, but that were in different departments across the entire organization. Somehow they all came together in order to make this happen. Yeah, I, I think it just took somebody who, you know, was willing to uh, take a risk, and that would be me, and actually kind of break out of their day job and and have the passion and the persistence to um, sort of shove it along a little bit. And, just or and, and organize it. And that was me. <laughs> and that was you. Well, congratulations. So, you know, Alaskan Airlines has a great reputation for being an environmental leader within the airline sector. Um, let's just dive back a little bit. What is an airline? Uh, obviously planes. Obviously mm -hmm. planes moving people around. Mm -hmm. uh, but what does an airline have to procure and bring together and put together into a service that then a passenger can enjoy and partake? What do they have to procure? Well, they have to procure millions and millions and millions of gallons of jet fuel, probably a few million tons of paper. Yeah, lots <laughs> a of lot supply, of food. lots of food. That's right. And then when you're at an airport, what is it that an airport is responsible for? And what is it that the airline is responsible for? And where does that boundary interface? Well, we're looked at, we're, we're a tenant of the airport. So in a way, we are a customer of the airport. And so we're the ones who are operating, you know, the aircraft that get you from point A to point B. And the airport is providing the infrastructure to get passengers into those aircraft comfortably and safely. And then we're getting them to the next airport comfortably and safely, or at least safely. So things like Alaska right now uh, has this 20-minute baggage guarantee, for instance, mm -hmm. right? 
It sounds like as a passenger that that is an Alaskan Airlines responsibility since you're creating the guarantee or the company creates the guarantee. Mm -hmm. But yet it is part of the airport infrastructure to be able to deliver that. So how much influence do you have in that interaction between the, the two? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a little bit of both. Obviously, we control the service that removes the, um, you know, gets the plane to the gate on time, gets the doors to the plane open on time and quickly, gets those employees to get those bags um, onto the conveyor belts and, you know, on, onto, the, onto the vehicles and things like that. And we um, certainly work with the airports to make sure that this, you know, before we unroll something like that, we want to make sure that we've got that sort of support at the airport um, in terms of the infrastructure to get it to baggage claim. In doing my research, I read a couple of interviews and uh, listened to a couple of interviews talking about how you had to get different stakeholders, like the catering team, uh, you know, to help with the recycling effort, the in-flight recycling effort that you started, uh, as well as the cabin crew and this person and that person, the, the waste management at each site to be able to work together to get the goal of recycling to happen. Right. How do you put together those stakeholders and how do you work with all of them together? Boy, you know, I, I don't know that we work with them all together at the same time, for sure. Every stakeholder owns a little teeny tiny piece of it. The flight attendants, well, they need to be engaged and they need to uh, learn how and what to collect in flight and get it into the right bag. And we need to you know, show them what those procedures are and make sure they understand that. Then we engage with the, the vendors at every single different location. We have a different catering vendor. Well, it's probably the same company, but it's a different airport with a different set of procedures and a different place on site where all the garbage is going. So the same people who are bringing the food are also taking the garbage off, usually to an off-site location. It's usually not on the airport properly. A lot of times it's off airport, like here is the SeaTac Airport. And we have to engage with them to understand that they know and that they have the ability to recycle the recyclables that the flight attendants are collecting from the passengers. So those are the two primary stakeholders that we have to engage with to make sure that gets done. And part of our food and beverage program, uh, we're working with the vendors all the time with the food. And we're also auditing them to make sure that they have the right, not only food handling procedures in place, but waste handling procedures in place. Mm -hmm. And that's part of their contract, you know, that they are going to recycle our commingled paper, glass, plastic, aluminum off of the aircraft because that's part of our service standard. Yep. At this point now, it certainly annoys me when I go onto another airline and they just simply take all the trash and put them all together. It looks like so easy to sort. You know, Alaska makes it look so easy to sort. Uh, it looks easy. <laughs> it's a lot hard. And it was it was very slow going to get that. I mean, we had something like 50 different flight kitchens around the country, and wow. then you are still not able to do it on international flights due to some archaic rules about international trash, and right. even the aluminum cans on the international flights wind up getting autoclaved or incinerated or something. Right, yeah, international uh, trash has to get uh, burnt, I, I think, is, mm -hmm. the, uh, is the rule, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the green team, then, how do you, inter what's the role within the organization of sustainability? Like, where does it sit? Where does it reside? And how do you influence the organization? Well, it's morphed over the years. So currently, the sustainability role reports up through corporate communications and public relations. The green team is has a different function than the very beginning. The very beginning, the, the green team was focused on actually getting some sort of governance and some sort of um, commitment and initiative around sustainability and proving the case for it. That was the original role of the green team. And now it's more of a mechanism for employee involvement, for them to learn and for them to act on like sort of small, champion smaller efforts in the workplace. So I know Alaska Airlines green team in the last um, year one of the things they uh, sponsored and championed was putting water bottle refilling stations at some of our buildings mm -hmm. in SeaTac, and um, I think installing, I think they're, they've been working on installing electric vehicle charging stations at some of our existing facilities. So they've been doing more projects like that, as well as communications with their other employees and putting together volunteer events and learning events. Like I took a tour of the Bullet Center to learn about the Bullet Center with some members of the green team last year. So, yeah, it's more employee involvement. Yeah, and the Bullet Center is one of the most, if not the most, energy efficient building in yes. the world. And so it's very Composting exciting. Composting toilets and all <laughs> kinds of 
water cisterns and things like that. It's very cool. Yeah, it's really fascinating to see what they've been able to do to pull these systems together right? mm -hmm. and make that function all together in, in mm -hmm. one. Let's look at the Alaskan airline in the broader airline and travel ecosystem. You know, Alaska is rated as an, the fifth largest airline in the country. Uh, it has over a billion dollars in revenue. And even though that sounds impressive, it is nothing compared to the total U.S. market of $181 billion. And right. So, I think they're only like five, six, four, well, somewhere three to five percent market share or something like that. Even something being like, the fifth largest carrier. When I started there, they were the 13th largest carrier. Yeah. And since then, the TWAs and the Northwests and the U.S. Airs have all vanished. All vanished or consolidated yep. into basically the big four, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a you know small airline, fifth largest yet small, you can be a lot more nimble. You can mm -hmm. make these changes. What do you see in the peer institutions, peer airlines that they're doing that you think, gosh, I wish we had the resources to do that yeah. or the other way around, we can do it faster than you guys. So yes, there is a benefit with being smaller and being more nimble, especially when it comes to the fleet. You have less aircraft, you can uh, refresh your fleet, make it more efficient more quickly. Um, you can upgrade your fleet more quickly, more efficiently. Uh, the other thing about Alaska Airlines, because we were flying so much into the state of Alaska with some of the weather and geographic challenges of flying into cities like Juneau, Alaska, is that we found it necessary to invest in um, better navigation, which saves a lot of money on fuel as well, RNP, required navigation performance. So, and again, smaller fleet size, it's easier to upgrade them so they all are equipped with RNP navigation instead of, you know, if you're looking at an airline that has a thousand planes or something like that, you've probably got some older planes that you haven't gotten around upgrading or equipping with the latest greatest or that, you know, it, it, it's a challenge to keep your fleet new. Yeah. So yes, so being a smaller airline helps with that. Being a smaller airline, especially not having as many international flights, helps with things like in-flight recycling, where you're not as challenged with, with some of the limitations on international recycling or international trash, rather. And uh, you tend to know everybody more. <laughs> <laughs> you tend to know everybody at the organization. Yeah. So that helps get things done. Smaller, but if you look at some someone like United, who has a lot of resources and a lot of pull and a lot of money you know they're doing some cool stuff with aviation sustainable aviation fuels they're onboarding sustainable aviation fuel at lax for example are you talking about biofuels or yeah yeah so fuel activity. made from something other than dead dinosaurs right yes right so jet a that's uh, biofuels of some sort Jet yeah. A fuel that's biofuel. Jet A, yeah. I'm not, I can't quite remember what they're using down there at LAX, but yes, yeah, so they're, they're onboarding sustainable aviation fuel down there. And so someone like that, they obviously have a much larger pull on the market to make these demands that Alaska could not yeah, They have more do money to invest, yes. And more money to invest. And, and I think another interesting situation of the ecosystem is that you know, at the end of the day, sustainability and resource management is a very local concern. Up here in the Northwest, we have plenty of water. Down in Arizona, they might have plenty of solar energy. Or, But as an airline, you have to deal with all of these regions and all mm -hmm. these local regions. So yeah. did you ever find situations where the concerns of one re uh, region were at odds with the concern of a different region? <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, um, I don't know if you've flown into uh, Texas lately and uh, walking around the airport with an aluminum can in your hand trying to figure out where you're going to recycle <laughs> it. I mean, it, I, I think being here on the on Emerald Edge, sometimes I feel like when I'm in other states in the Midwest or the South, they have a completely different cultural ideas about environmental issues than we do. I think there was only one flight kitchen in the whole country we couldn't recycle at, and that was New Orleans. So they just, it was foreign to them. Yeah. So it's funny because we're in this bubble here and we just assume that everybody else is thinking like we do. So I agree with that. You know, from a aviation, sustainable aviation fuel side, fuel, fuel is a huge challenge and whatever you make your fuel out of, it has, the infrastructure is going to be there 
for it to be available locally. It's very expensive and difficult to ship fuel across the country. Obviously, we're not going to be making sustainable aviation fuel out of palm oil here in Seattle because mm -hmm. there's no palm trees. So we have to use, you know, the carbon that's available to us, like woody biomass or algae or maybe some camelina from crops in eastern Washington or garbage or something like that, you know, versus if you go down south, I think our first uh, our our first biofuel we used in 2011 was made out of uh, residuals from like a chicken nugget factory <laughs> in the South. Was it not Arkansas? I can't quite recall. It was 23 dollars a gallon or thereabout. Wow. And we had because we had to have it shipped all the way from the South because that was the only place we could find it. It's fascinating to hear that back in 2012, that was probably the beginning of these aviation biofuel efforts. At least in this country, 2011, uh, we were the first airline to have multiple flights. United beat us by one day. They were the first domestic flight using sustainable aviation fuel was the day before ours. I don't know how oh. they scooped us on that, <laughs> but we beat them because we had 75 flights the next day. Ah, excellent, excellent. Do you find uh, you know the airlines are competing on these sustainability metrics? A little bit, especially around fuels and stuff. That's kind of sexy news. Yeah. yeah. Around straws, when we discontinued plastic straws, we were competing on that. I think those are the two things that come top of mind to me when competing on a sustainability issue. The airlines competing on that is great, from your experience, do customers notice? Customers notice what they see, right? So they don't realize that one airline is 25% more efficient than another airline overall, or that a certain kind of aircraft is more efficient than the other ones. They don't see that. They do see the flight attendants collecting recyclables versus trash. And you know, like you said to me earlier, it's like you get used to that. And especially from your, when you're in Seattle, when that's natural to you to just sort your waste all the time, whether you're at school, at home, at work, or in the airport. And then, of course, you want to do it while you're in the plane, too. That just makes sense. And so when you fly on another carrier, you go to a different airport that's not in Seattle and you can't do that. Um, that that's frustrating to people. When we start thinking of the ecosystem, there's the you know the the other airlines that you're competing with, and the other travel options. Then there's also the sustainability indexes and Wall Street and investor concerns. Mm -hmm. So how much of your job was then dealing with these investor stakeholders? So I didn't deal too much with the investors directly, but I was very keen on the metrics they were looking for, the governance, the ESG indicators, the governance indicators. So I did spend fair amount of time on um, replying to CDP, filling out DGSI applications and surveys. And we did make DGSI two years in a row, 2017, 2018. Keep my fingers crossed for this year. Lots of questionnaires from a lot of different raters and rankers out there. So uh, yes, I definitely, I spent more than half of my time in the weeds, making sure the data was right, collecting data, figuring out where the next data needs were coming from. And then pounding my head on the desk when <laughs> <laughs> the data was not there. Or something. <laughs> well, it's just like, well, we'd like to know how many kilograms of uh, CO2 per revenue ton mile. Okay, that's fine. Well, we really want to know how many metric tons per revenue passenger mile. Well, okay. Well, we want to know how many grams per uh, fuel you use in passenger per available seat mile per. Revenue, see, you know, everybody had a slightly different way they wanted the data. So based there on, was that. Based on their reporting. And just really quickly, you threw out a lot of uh, acronyms. I just want mm -hmm. to clarify. ESG is Environmental and Social Governance, yes. which is coming at it from a governance viewpoint, board level governance viewpoint of this data. Uh, you talked about CDP, which is the Carbon Disclosure Project. And that's looking at this set of data from a carbon and emissions point of view. And then you also threw um, DJSI, which is the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, that's looking at it more from a financial and stock price point of view. And so each one of them have a slightly different spin of how they want their data to be viewed, the purpose of their data, and probably influencing that presentation, how they wanted you to do your calculation. You know, there's probably a dozen, if not more, of these different types of sustainability indexes reporting requirements and whatnot. I, you, know, you started to hint at a couple of these differences and nuances between them, but you know, are there questions that they ask which you think are some of them that are just 
irrelevant, but yet they just <laughs> want you to keep answering them over and over again. Well, <laughs> did I hit a nerve there? <laughs> well, the, the DJSI on its own, I mean, thankfully that particular one, um, they geared the 100 and the 100 to 137 page, thank you very much, <laughs> survey <laughs> uh, uh, towards the industry. Some are just blankets that any industry could use. And so there's a lot of things that are not material to an airline. Um, and some things are much more material to an airline. Yeah, yeah. They, and they all had a different take. And yes, there were a lot of, there's definitely more than a dozen. And some of them, after a while, you, you kind of rank the ones that you think are important. And we always did CDP. We always did DGSI. We always did uh, use uh, Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI, for our sustainability reporting. So I paid attention to those three. And then whatever the new sexy brand new one came out that week. <laughs> I forget what the latest one was, but there there was a new one every couple of months. And you, you had to limit yourself to your top five favorite surveys and... Uh, figure out how you're going to answer them and constantly trying to determine which ones are the most important ones to answer. And I know that in the in the reporting market, there is an effort to consolidate and streamline some of this information because I think this complaint from companies have become quite strong of there's just simply too many standards that they're yes. being held to. Yes. And they don't know which one is going to be the, the sexy one, sexy one of the month. So how much of your time as sustainability manager was then I guess, compliance-oriented versus initiative-oriented. Oh, well, you know, the way way we had our strategy um, set up was we had, depending on what year it was, we had up to 20 or 25 key performance indicators in about 11 different areas. So we had indicators around, Mm -hmm. of course, you know, carbon emissions, around waste recycling and waste reduction around paper, around diversity, around energy use. So a lot of different key areas and performance indicators in that area. And as a one person department or a less than one person department, (laughs) you know, you didn't get to do a lot of initiatives. It was more around convincing others to do initiatives. So, hey, facilities department, you know, you promised us you'd get your energy use company-wide in the buildings that we own down to X number of kilowatts per, you know, square foot of building space, whatever their indicator was. You know, what projects are going to get us there this year? What are you going to do for me this year? What can we do? You know, so I was trying to kind of coach them and mentor them, put them in touch with maybe somebody who's been successful in another area, or if you see ideas, bring them to that organization and do whatever you can to support them and help them meet that goal. But ultimately they got to decide what projects they were pursuing. Maybe somebody would give me an idea. Hey, the boy, the Portland hangar really needs relamping. And it's like, Hey, have you guys thought about that? How can I help? I didn't get to do the initiatives. They got to do the initiatives, and I just got to badger them into doing initiatives. Yes. You got to play matchmaker, essentially. To play matchmaker, yes. Yeah. Here's an idea. There's a problem. Let's see if we can put this together, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of exploration. So what were some of the most innovative things that you saw in during your time of, you know, putting these initiatives and badgering people, cajoling people into into projects? Well, I mean, I've always been really proud of our in-flight recycling team. And that's just been so cool to see that evolve, evolve over the years. We, uh, well, you know, one project I did bring to our facilities team was uh, putting a wind turbine on the Nome, at the Nome airport. Way and, up in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> way up in Alaska. And it's still working. Yeah. It's like 40 below and 120 mile an hour winds up there sometimes and it's still working. But when you're paying, you know, $8 a gallon for heating fuel and, Energy is a lot more expensive up there, even for electricity. And the wind's blowing all the time. It just seems to make sense. Mm-hmm. Some of the other innovations, I, I, I think I, I think one big push that we had there was going paperless at the company. And going paperless never sounds sexy to anybody. But when you think of how much efficiency uh, that helped us with and how it helps get the plane turned around faster, that when pilots don't have to get pieces of paper signed and take them to a file and pull out a manual and move around... And, and get something signed off over here and then take a picture of it over there when you can do it all with an iPad. Um, just saves so much time, makes it such a more lean, efficient process and uh, cuts down on all those 
mountains and mountains, mountains of paper that we're sending over to Iron Mountain to keep in storage for 20 years. <laughs> and then our good because, friend Kevin Hagen is going to take have to take care of right, them. Right, because airline records, you know, you've got to maintain records forever and ever and ever. And if you can do that electronically, uh, that's going to save you a lot of landscape. Do you have other examples of these everyday actions that you think accumulates towards this broader sustainability effort? You know, I, I think about uh, I think about the sourcing of our in-flight supplies is what I think of when I think of that. Because you don't really realize that when you're sitting on an aircraft, you've got like a cocktail napkin and a cup and a stir stick and a can, and then you've got your meal and you, you're just looking at what's in front of you. You just see, you know, a beverage container and some food, but talking about 500 flights a day and millions and millions and millions of passengers every year, just on one airline, all the other airlines out there, that's a serious amount of garbage that adds up. And so just every little step, so just one stir stick, if you can remove one stir stick out of everybody's drinks, that's like 22 million stir sticks a year. And you know how many wow. tons of plastic <laughs> that is. Hmm. If you could um, use recycled paper napkins, if you could start looking at ways to um, reduce the waste in those processes, that winds up having a huge impact in the long run. Winds adding up mm -hmm. quite substantially. That's a really interesting answer. You know, with the people that you've worked with, and uh, what are the key skill sets that you have seen be help people become successful in sustainability or in their jobs? Um, now, the former director, I might have his title wrong, of sustainability at McDonald's, Bob Landry. Do you know him? No. I listened to him talk once years ago, and I, I think he hit it on the, the nose. He said it was the three P's. It was passion, persistence, and patience. Maybe not necessarily in that order. I know I have two of them. I don't know if I have the patience part, but I do have the passion and the persistence. So, yeah, I think it's willing to wake up every morning and go out and do battle every single day and don't take no for an answer and keep beating on the walls and the doors and whatever with your head to keep this ball rolling because it, you know, you're a change agent and it's an uphill, it's an uphill battle. It's not easy. We're changing the way people are thinking. We're changing the way we do business as usual. And you know, it's really easy to keep doing things the same way that you've always done it, even though it's really wasteful. And, um, it takes a lot. What I used to say, it takes, um, 30,000 calories to move one inch. <laughs> one inch, but you've got that inch. You yep. can't roll back, you know? And then you got to somehow or another muster up another 30,000 calories of persistence and passion to move the ball another inch. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, at some point, you get more hands on the ball pushing so it doesn't maybe take you 30,000 calories of expended energy to get that program moving and get some momentum going to get things done and change other people's mindsets. Let's go back to your range of influence. And where do you think you were decisions that you could make that you could make really quickly? And what were some decisions that you thought you really had to slow down and make really slowly? I find making decisions quickly really easy. It doesn't mean I'm going to get anywhere just because I made the decision. <laughs> Especially if you're the, uh, you're the cheerleader, right? And getting other people to do things. <laughs> yes, cheerleader, cattle prodder, whatever, <laughs> sheep herder, whatever it is. So yes, I made a lot of decisions really quickly and sometimes they didn't always work out. Ask the question one more time because I, already, I started to go down well, a path with that and I forgot it already. Well, I guess another way to rephrase it is what decisions do you think got implemented faster than you expected and which ones took a lot longer than you expected the one the one that takes longer than expected was anything to do with building energy efficiency i would think that would be a complete no-brainer it's like hey look it's got a two and a half year payback if we relamp this hangar you know and the maintenance employees aren't going to have to change the light bulbs quite as much and well but there's so many good reasons to do this and you guys have a huge budget you know i would just think this would be a no-brainer for you guys and uh, it, it was always challenging to get anything to do with buildings done. It was, hmm. I, I don't know, they're probably pulled in so many different directions and so few resources and so challenging to prioritize in that group. Removing plastic straws from people's cups, it's almost overnight. It was so simple. Wow. Yeah. It was just like, 
Hey, no, that's a great idea. Yeah, no, this is good timing. Let's do it. Okay. Wow. Let's use up our stock and then we're done. Okay. That was really quick. That so was a shocker. Could be as quick as a day in some cases. If, yeah, I mean, we, had, we right. had some stock we had to burn yeah. that we already had that we had to do something with. So we might as well use it to stir drinks instead yeah. of throwing it in the trash. But, um, yeah, it was, everybody's like, no, I'm in agreement. No, this is great. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, now's the time. Yeah, once we finally decided that now is the time, because we've been tossing it around, tossing it around, never really said, let's do it. And when we said, let's do it, we just did it. What do you think are the big, biggest needs of future expertise? I never really felt like the job was about expertise because mm -hmm. I don't really have any. <laughs> <laughs> and yet you accomplished so much. <laughs> I had, I learned about this, you know, just by, I was like desperate to learn more. I would just learned about it by reading as many books as I possibly get, get my hands on every single sustainability book that I could get free from the library. How did they do this? What do I do next? How do I form a steering committee? How do I set goals? You know, and fortunately there was a few books out there already mm -hmm. to help me, but I definitely think it needs to be elevated more. It can't be a standalone department. I mm -hmm. mean, I always thought that I would my job is to work my way out of a job, you know, I should not be the one to have expertise in, um, energy management. That's our facilities department. That's what they do anyway. That's, that's, you know, I don't know anything about installing light bulbs or insulating buildings or anything to do with energy efficiency. That's our facilities group. They do that. And if they have a sustainability goal integrated into the way they do business over there, and if they have sustainable thinking over there, then I don't, I don't have to sheep herd them anymore. I don't have to chase them around and make suggestions and they're just going to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately we shouldn't need sustainability professionals because we'll be just integrated. within the organization. Just yeah. integrated it's into best be practice. part of the way they do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for someone who's looking at getting into the sector then or getting into what you do, like how would you recommend them to get started? When I hire interns every year, it's a lot of, uh, I get a lot of intern applications. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, you can be looking at 300 applications and mm. I would throw out every single one where the person didn't reach out to me independently of the resume process. Cause there's no point because you have to be a self-starter. You have to have initiative and you have to have a little drive, right? So if you're just sending in, I mean, this is me, if you're just sending in an application, um, to our HR, you know, giant database in the cloud kind of thing, you're really not demonstrating any sort of initiative. And also a lot of students would talk about all these great papers they did in their classes and their GPA and that kind of stuff. I don't care about that. Show me that you've done something. Show me that you started a compost and collection thing in your school or that in your job you persuaded management to get rid of water bottles or something like that because then you really know more about what it really takes to implement a sustainability initiative in the workplace, right? You understand you know, maybe how, how to relay the business case or how to influence people or how an organization works or, um, and then you have, again, the passion and the persistence to get it done. So you're a doer, not a analyzer or a thinker or a report mm. writer type of thing. It's kind so, of looking for the opportunities hidden in the crack and just going, Ooh, I'm going to chase that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was looking, so I was definitely looking more, more of that. So when, um, hopefully People are practicing in the places they're already at. They're practicing yeah. at work, regardless of what their job is. They're practicing at school. Um, and you see lots of kids doing that. They're going to the principal and saying, hey, our lunchroom, we shouldn't be using styrofoam cups in the cafeteria. What can we do? You know, and, and, and we've come up with some alternatives. Let's change that. And influencing their teachers, their principals, their managers, you know, their coworkers type of thing. So... I think it's the, the drive and the ability to influence or the skills that are more important than understanding how to do a carbon footprint. It's the wielder of the cattle at least for Yeah, at least for, <laughs> for roles like mine, because I rely on the other divisions to understand the technical aspects. And it's for me to make their lives so miserable that they, <laughs> <laughs> that they accomplish what it is that I want them to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it always takes a persistent driver to be able to keep these initiatives on track and to achieve the great results that you've been able to do at Alaska. So, so thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Gia.
You have been listening to the Levers for Change podcast, where we search for who has responsibility for what when implementing change. My name is Jimmy Gia, and the music is by Sean Hart. Please subscribe to our podcast for new episodes and share with a friend. Please visit our website at www.leversforchangepodcast.com for additional episodes, books, and other resources. Thank you again, and remember, when trying to change the world, search for your levers for change.